Well, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Please be seated in God's presence. It's just a great joy, a great honor to be here at Elevation. Is, uh, this is just a crazy church. Uh, and uh, good crazy. Good crazy. It's just, uh, just a great honor to be on this platform again and to share the platform with your pastor and his wife and, and to observe the great work that they are doing. Uh, this is a fascinating work. It's a church on the cutting edge. It is a church of the future. It's a church reaching people. Uh, reaching people that most churches would not be able to reach. Um, and this tells us where Christianity in Africa is going uh, because you represent the future face of Christianity uh, all over our continent and God has brought you to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's an honor to be here. Um, we trust that tonight the little we say can be a great blessing to you, that God will help you, God will strengthen you, and you will accelerate, and uh, you will grow stronger, and you will do exploits for God. I'm going to preach, go straight into the word of God. I'm, I've titled my message, This is How We Overcome. This is How We Overcome. I trust that it will be a message that will speak to you as you deal with the reality of life. Life is real, and it's got real problems. But we also have real victory in Christ Jesus. And in him we are more than conquerors. First John chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. First John chapter 4, verses 2 to to fall. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The verse 4 is always normally quoted in the language of the old King James. Uh, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. It's a very interesting word there in verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. The word overcome is a very interesting word because it says what it is spelt like. To overcome means that something is going to come and you will go over. It means something is going to come against you and when it comes against you, it will not crush into you. You will just rise above it. And I believe that tonight you will over everything that comes against you. So basically, is to go over, is to rise above, is to be elevated above what is coming against you. To overcome also means to succeed against the competition. It implies that there will be a competition or there will be people challenging what you have to offer. To overcome deals with challenges and with winning. 
To overcome is to break through a resistance, something that wants to stop you from making an advance. When you overcome it, you break that resistance, and I trust God will cause you to overcome. Now, in the passage, and normally uh, when I'm teaching, I stay with the text and uh, try to work with the text as much as possible. In the passage, we are told what is coming against us. Because in verse 2, it says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. It is within that context that the Bible says we have overcome. So there is something coming against the church. There is something coming against the believer and it is called the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist. A very interesting concept. The Antichrist, and I suppose that some of you have heard about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a personality or an entity who would be revealed sometime in the history of the human race. In our future, this personality will be revealed and he will be everything that is opposite of Christ. But in a sense also look like Christ, but be opposite him. He would look like Christ in the sense that he would have power to also do miracles and signs and wonders, but the source of that power would be everything that is against God. It would be the devil himself. Just like uh, Jesus was God come in the flesh, the Antichrist will be the devil in the flesh, fully manifested. And somewhere in the history of the human race, this personality will emerge. That's going to happen somewhere in the future. He's not yet manifested, although sometimes you look at some people and they look like the Antichrist. But we have to be patient with them. Uh, he's not come yet. Now, in the passage, it talks about the spirit of the Antichrist. So although the Antichrist has not manifested physically, the spirit by which he will operate is already in operation. And how are we going to know the spirit of the Antichrist? The passage tells us. That every spirit that does not confess that Christ has come in the flesh is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now what does that mean? It means that the Antichrist is against the manifestation of Christ in the natural world. The Antichrist is against the manifestation of Christ in the physical world. The Antichrist is not really bothered about the presence of Christ in the spirit. So far as he remains in the spirit. But any time Christ is going to manifest physically, there is going to come a resistance of the Antichrist. What does that mean? It means that the Antichrist opposes those who have the spirit of Christ in them manifesting Christ physically. He opposes those who have the spirit of Christ in them manifesting Christ physically. What does that mean? Now, how many of you believe you have Christ in you? Okay, most of you believe so. Some of you are still thinking through the question. How many of you believe you have Christ living in you? Okay, all right. Christ lives in us by his spirit. But any time we do something as a result of the spirit dwelling in us that must be seen by people, we have manifested Christ. Christ has been seen in the flesh. So, for example, this auditorium is Christ manifested. When somebody sees this building or comes into this building, they would instantly see what these people believe is now given manifestation 
This building is Christ manifested. When a church builds an, a big building, it's Christ manifested. When a believer wants to do something great for God, it is Christ manifested in the world. The spirit of the Antichrist, his main agenda is to make sure that the believer has Christ in him, but never manifest Christ. So anytime a believer attempts to manifest Christ, he's going to come against a resistance. It's called the spirit of the Antichrist. So, for example, if uh, a church uh, is spirit-filled, tongue-talking, but never do anything, they never build anything, they never do anything great, they never do anything fascinating, no opposition for them because Christ has not been manifested. But the day that church decides it's going to do something significant for God, Everything in hell is going to break loose against that person because that person is moving from Christ within to Christ outside. I hope you are getting it. So if you are a believer, for example, and uh, you love the Lord and you speak in tongues and you pray in the spirit, but you never attempt anything big, life will be very normal for you. But the day you decide, I'm going to build a factory, I'm going to do something great, I'm going to build my house, I'm going to build a factory, uh, I'm going to build a, a business, I'm going, to, I'm going to do something for the world to see that what I believe is real in the physical world, the spirit of the Antichrist will rise up. So don't ever be surprised when people sometimes out of nowhere rise up against the church have you noticed have you noticed in this world that when any organization built something massive everybody is happy when a big stadium is built for football everybody is happy oh what a great stadium a big hospital is built everybody says oh that is a great project a big school is built Everybody is happy. Uh, a big nightclub is built. Everybody say, wow, what a great project. A big hotel is built. Wow. Just name it for any sector of life. If people go to Dubai and see the Burj Khalifa and the tallest building, they say, wow. They see the, the one on the sea, the Burj Al Arab. They say, wow. People go to Las Vegas and see all these gambling facilities and they praise it and people write about development and all of that. The only thing people never rejoice when it is built is a church building. Build a massive church building and the first question people is going to ask is why don't you give the money to the poor? Have you noticed that? Yes. Now, the people who build the Burj Al Arab, have they solved the poverty problem in the world? No. We're building, we're watching the World Cup. Everybody's watching Russia. Look at those stadiums. Have they solved the poverty problem? No. If one church was like one stadium, the story will be different. Why is it that the world permits everybody else to manifest what they have, but never feel comfortable when the church is manifesting? This is the reason. Because the Bible says the spirit of the Antichrist is against Christ manifested in the flesh. Anytime a believer seeks to do anything extraordinary, they are going to come against the spirit of the Antichrist. It is the job of the spirit of the Antichrist, therefore, to hedge the church in and to keep the church locked in and the church unexpressive. They would want the church just to be very spiritual but never materially manifested. That is the essence of the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, for you as a believer, if you want to do anything yourself extraordinary, you're going to come against the spirit of the Antichrist. Now you may say, well, uh, everybody comes against that. No. You see, when Satan was going to tempt Jesus, you remember the, 
temptation of Jesus when he was after he had finished fasting. Ten stones to bread. Jesus says no. Throw yourself up. Jesus says no. Final temptation. Takes him up a mountain. Show him all the nations of the world. Shows him all the wealth of the world. Shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And all the glories of the world. And then he makes a very interesting statement. He says, all of these have been delivered to me. And I give it to whomsoever I will. They've been delivered to me and I can give it to whoever I will. And he says to Jesus, bow before me and I will give it to you. Now Jesus didn't say the devil is a liar. If the statement was a lie, he would have said, Satan, you are a liar. You don't have that power and you can't give it to anybody. Jesus didn't refute that statement. Jesus simply said, I will not bow to you. In other words, I want that power. There are two ways I'm that, that power can be gotten. I can get all of that by bowing to Satan. That's one way. That's what is being offered. Or I'm going to get it somehow in my own way. Well, we know that at the end of the book, he got it. Because when he resurrected, he said, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what Jesus was saying is, I want it, but I'm not going to bow to you to get it. I'm going to get it by my victory, which we're going to talk about very soon, uh, which I prevailed on the cross through the blood of Jesus. But the reality of that fact is that Satan also is committed to empowering people whose agenda will not be for God. So if somebody will bow to Satan, they would have power. The counter is when we bow to God, we also have the same power. It is in the interest of the Antichrist to ensure that a genuine born again believer doesn't manifest Christ in the flesh. He can have Christ in his spirit, he can worship him quietly, he can pray quietly, but anytime they step out to do something extraordinary, the Antichrist is going to come against him. The good news is that we have overcome them we have overcome them so the spirit of the antichrist opposes the manifestation of christ in the flesh now so the passage tells us what is coming against us the spirit of the antichrist why he doesn't want christ to be manifested in the flesh in the natural world then he tells us what is working for us he says you are of god you are of God in other words your place in God is a weapon and then not only did he say you are of God he says that God is also in you the greater one is in you who God is to us and whom we are to him is key to overcoming the spirit of the Antichrist Revelations chapter 12 verse 10 to 12 Revelations 12, 10 to 12 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Satan, who is the father of the Antichrist, is called the accuser. He's called an accuser. An accuser is one who finds fault and speaks against another. One who is always blaming. One who is always looking for an offense. One who is always trying to find fault. It says that Satan is an accuser and, and it is his job 
and he does it constantly how does satan accuse us five ways that he accuses us one he accuses us to god satan accuses us to god anytime we fall short he denounces us to god he accused job before god and continue to accuse us before god his desire is that god will give up on us god will say i'm tired of these guys they mess up too much i don't want to deal with them any longer he never succeeds but he never gives up if there is any good thing about the devil he never gives up the devil never quits he's been bound he's been cast out he's been uh he's been uh uh maltreated throughout the ages still going strong never gives up never gives up so he accuses us before god it never works but he continues to accuse us before god not only does he accuse us before god he accuses god to us so he accuses us to god god these people are no good then people god is no good Anytime we feel discouraged, he accuses God before us. Satan is the one who keeps throwing words of doubt in our minds concerning God's faithfulness. He's the one who makes us feel as if our worship is for nothing. When he accuses God before you, he tells you, but you've been faithful in the house of God. You've tithed, you have given, you have been faithful, you have prayed, you attend every meeting. Why are you going through all of these things? And somehow makes you feel that because you have served God and because you're going through difficulty, God has not held his end of the bargain. He accuses us to God. He accuses God to us. Then he accuses us to our brethren. When we go through some trouble, he whispers in people's minds words of suspicion. He points our mistakes out to people. People who are supposed to help us all of a sudden depart from us because they are hearing words of accusation against us. He accuses us to God. He accuses God to us. He accuses us to our brethren. And number four, he accuses us to our brethren. When our brethren sin or are misunderstood, he accuses them to us. He's the one who makes you always look at somebody and give up on the person. You look at somebody and say, this person has no future. This person would not be able to achieve anything substantial. That is the accusation of Satan against your brother. But the most dangerous accusation of all is that he accuses us to ourselves. He's the one who makes you feel you are no good. You look down on yourself, self-pity. You despise your talents. You despise your assets. You despise opportunities. He talks you out of greatness. When you think you can't achieve much in life, guess who is accusing you to yourself? It's Satan talking to you. When you think no one loves you, Satan is talking to you. When you feel everyone is your enemy, that's the devil's accusation. Because you can't be the only person in this world where everybody is your enemy. When you keep talking about your past failures, that's Satan's accusation. When you think everyone has left you behind, that's Satan's accusation. When you think your prayers are not powerful enough, that's Satan's accusation. I've heard people sometimes say, I pray and I, I feel like my prayer is not going. Well, prayer doesn't go. We, we don't, our prayer doesn't travel kilometers to get to God. Our prayer doesn't travel a distance to get to God. Because God answers our prayer according to the power that is at work in us. The power is not outside of us. The power is in us and sometimes people say well my prayer is as if my prayer hit the ceiling your prayer doesn't go up the god god connects from within you let me give you an example i don't know where power is generated from here nigeria is quite an interesting place i'm sure <laughs> but all things being equal if 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 you were getting electricity from the mains uh, there would be maybe a thermal plant or some other plant in Lagos That's, is there something like that I know everybody has a generator here but just suspend that concept and let's think the normal thing that everybody connects power from 
uh, a dam or, or a plant. Now, let, so, so the plant generates the power. The plant generates the power. There are high tension cables that bring the power to a substation. Substation brings it to your facility and so on. No matter how much power that is at the plant, what works in your house or in your home is not the power in the plant. It is the power that is in your house from your own switchboard. So when you turn on the light, the power that works in your house is the power that has come in your house. That power in your house is connected to the main. Between the main and your house, there is a connection. But what works for you is the one that has come to your house. It's the same with the power of God. There is power in heaven. That power in heaven is hooked up to power in you. When you want to pray, you don't run to heaven with your prayer. Your, the power is already hooked in you. There's a substation inside you. It's called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in you is hooked up to the power of God. So when you pray, your prayer doesn't have to travel. It's like when I turn on the electricity here, it doesn't have to travel to the dam. It just go to the switchboard and I get power. It's the same thing. Our prayer doesn't travel. Our prayer is at work according to the power that works in us. You follow me? So therefore, if you are praying and the devil says your prayer is going nowhere, well, where is it supposed to go to? <laughs> or you're praying in a room and you just feel God is not hearing you. God is not hearing me. I feel God is far away. Well, if you want to say he's far away, I don't know where God is geographically. But the universe is a very wide expanse. It takes millions and billions of light years to cross our universe. If God created the universe, then he lives outside of the universe. So if your prayer is going to go through the Milky Way galaxy and go through all of that to get to God, go beyond the universe to get to God, you have a long time to wait. You have a long time to go, wait. But the power, the prayer doesn't travel. Never ever think when you pray, God had to take time to hear. He says, before you pray, I heard the power is in us. So how do we overcome the enemy, our accuser? And the Bible tells us a few things we used to accuse. First, it says the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is our power. And what does the blood of Jesus do? The blood of Jesus cleanses us, makes us acceptable to God. When we sin, the blood of Jesus washes us. You know, I know that thought sometimes is uncomfortable for people because people feel you make salvation so easy that, you know, you sin, the blood of Jesus washes you. You sin, the blood of Jesus washes you. Well, Peter asked Jesus a very uh, interesting question. He says, how many times must I give, forgive my neighbor uh, in a day? Jesus, seven times? No, he thought seven was a good number. You know, seven times? Jesus says 70, 70 times seven. Now, if God expects us to forgive 70 times 7, do you think he'll do less? All right. So, if a believer sins and God forgives you and he sins again, and God forgives you and he sins again, God forgives him, sins again, God forgives him, sins again, God forgives him, sins again, will God continue to forgive him? Yes. So, should I continue to sin? It's like a person who is running a race, you're running a race. You have a white jersey on, and you're supposed to finish the race, get to the end with a white jersey. But along the route, there is mud. And if you're not careful, you'll fall into the mud. But you can't finish the race with the mud on your jersey. So you go run, 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 you fall into the 
uh, mud, you have to go back to the starting line. You are given white jersey again. You run, 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 run. You fall down. You go back. You get white jersey. Yeah, you're getting white jersey, but don't you think you are being a bit silly? There is a race ahead of you. Don't you think you should at least get one white jersey and make sure it doesn't get messed up so that you can finish the race? You will be forgiven, but you are wasting your time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting energy. There is something far more better than forgiveness waiting for you. God will forgive you at 70 times 7. And if you exhaust all of that, because some people need more space. If you exhaust all of that in one day, his grace will still abound. But you're going to delay your progress in life. You're going to delay your purpose in life. But the blood of Jesus washes us. There is no sin beyond the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. Don't ever allow the devil to tell you because of a sin that you committed some time ago, God is punishing you today and that's why your life is not getting on well. No, God does not hold guilt against us when we confess our sins. If you come to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But as a smart human being, you have to make sure that you are not tripped and you are not beset by sin that you are able to run the race to the end without any weight or hindrance but the blood of Jesus is there to cleanse us the blood of Jesus is our covenant the blood of Jesus is our covenant keeps us in covenant with God the blood of Jesus is our covering keeps us safe in Christ the blood of Jesus on the doorposts of Israel in the land of Egypt, protected them from the angel of death. The blood of Jesus is your protection. The blood of Jesus is your protection. You don't need anything else beyond the blood of Jesus. I know Africans, one of the big problems, Africans are like the Jews. We're, we're like the Jews in many ways. It's difficult to, for us to believe in an unseen God. We have to always see something. So the, the, the Jews, God will open the Red Sea, do all kinds of things for them, but they need to see something. They need to see a calf, a golden calf. They need to hold something. They need something. So, so their faith always must have an object. Their faith must have an object. And God says, don't, don't, no object, no object, no object, just believe me. Uh, but, but I need to hold something. God said, no, no, don't hold nothing. Just, just believe me. But, but, but I need something. So we are always trying to get something. You know, drink this water. Get this one. You know, put this on you. Wear that. Put this around your waist. This under your pillow. And, 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 and even when we become born again, spirit filled, we still want something. We still want something. We want something to hold. But when we come into Christ, there is nothing to hold. There is nothing to see. There is nothing to touch. There is nothing to drink. We walk by faith and not by sight. God is not looking for tokens. Emblems. I know as Africans, it helps our faith. But it doesn't really help our faith. It diminishes our faith in the unknown and unseen God. The God we cannot see whom we fully believe. That is what faith is. I don't need to touch anything to believe. I don't need to drink anything to believe. The power of God is not a liquid that I drink or something that I bath with. The power of God is universal. And we walk by believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Because of that, when it comes to covering, because Africans like protection. Because the African spirituality 
always envisions that there are cosmological forces engaged in warfare somewhere somewhere that we must be protected from there are male violent forces that these forces have got power and that if you don't do something they would do something so we always want to do something when I was a kid, you know, mo most mothers like to protect their children. My, my mother was a nice woman, you know, but ignorant, but nice. And took us to places and they would catch you in, you know, some places and put some black powder in there. And then next time they would, you go in somewhere, you're drinking something. Next time they give you something, put under your pillow. Sometimes next time there is a brass uh, ring you must wear sometimes there is a necklace you must wear they're trying to protect because they're hey, she's an african she believes you must have something to protect you i came here to announce to you you don't need any object to protect you the blood of jesus was shed two thousand years ago and that blood is sufficient and and efficient to protect you against every weapon that is formed against you There is no demonic power that can stop you from progress. There is no weapon of the enemy. There is no incantation of the enemy. There is no release of spiritual power. You may hear the person has killed a cow, has killed a goat, has actually killed a cat in addition. And killed a dog and maybe a parrot also added to the mix. And, and, and you've heard all, they've done all of that and they've planted something in your house yeah that is all they can do but the greater one works on our behalf and the blood of jesus is sufficient and efficient this is how we overcome by the blood of the lamb so when you go out there and you see men who are competing and you you know whom they consult and the incantations you don't try and look for the same form that they have. We walk with a cool and calm assurance that the blood of Jesus Christ covers us. You can go into the enemy's camp and you can do exploits where Satan is planted and you do great things for God. The spirit of the Antichrist cannot stop you because we have the blood of Jesus. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. That is why I am fully persuaded that you will build that building, you will build that factory, you will build that business, you will, you will do it in your time. Because of the blood of Jesus. Because of the blood of Jesus. I remember when I was a kid, my father died. And the people from his village came, as happens in our parts of the world, to collect the properties that he left behind. And so there was this guy who came leading the people from the village. And I had just been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, I resisted him. I was just a young boy, teenager, resisted him and said he couldn't take out the things and it became a tug of war uh, and, and the man took off, he was wearing a cover cloth, he took it off I think to impress me not with his muscle but with the armaments African armaments, there were all kinds of talismans and leather and all kinds of stuff around him and one of the guys who came said, you, you have to be careful. This man, if you talk against him, you, 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 you won't see that the sun will not set on you. That's what he said. But I had just been filled with the Holy Ghost. And I started speaking in tongues. And started making declaration before him that I, I would live and he would not live. I'm sorry I said he would not live. I didn't know as much as I know now. I would have said, I should have said he should live to see the salvation of the Lord. But I said he should not live. And Lord, I'm sorry that I dispatched him too quickly. But, but he, he, he went. He went. He went back to the village. Next thing I heard, I, I don't take pride in that. I don't take pride in that because we don't rejoice in the, in, in the death of a sinner. Every sinner 
uh, must be saved uh, and before, before they go to meet their maker. Uh, but I didn't know much. And I, I hope I didn't send him too quickly. But all I'm saying is, we have the power. Somebody say, I have the power. Say, I will build it. Say, I will do it. Say, I will manifest it. Because of me, Christ will be seen. Because when you build that factory, and people ask, who built it? They would say, that child of God. That is Christ in the flesh. You build that hotel, that is Christ manifested. You build that stadium, that is Christ manifested. And very soon, you build that airport, that is Christ manifested. That is Christ manifested. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. And then we overcome him also by the word of our testimony. Our testimony is based on our convictions. Our convictions. We settle in our hearts that God loves us. You have to settle that God loves you. God has no second class children. God doesn't love me care of anybody. God loves me directly by himself. And God loves you. And God hears you when you pray. God hears you when you pray. I said, God hears you when you pray. Amen. Answer to prayer is not based on feeling. I remember the first time I went to a broadcasting studio to speak. I was just there at this station, microphone in front of me, somebody interviewed me, just two people. And we talked in the microphone. But millions of people heard us. But if you looked at it, it didn't look like I was talking to millions of people. It's not about your feeling. It's about the technology that is taking what you say and using it. There is spiritual technology that when you pray, you may feel you are quiet in your room, you are powerless in your room, but when you say, Father, I come in the name of Jesus, heaven opens for you. Father, I say in the name of Jesus, heaven opens for you. Because when we say in the name of Jesus, we are not praying through Jesus. You know, Christians, we don't pray through Jesus. We pray in his name. Now, what's the difference? Now, praying through Jesus can be a very, very hard prayer. Because then the prayer has to travel from Lagos. And then go beyond the solar system. Finally get to where God is. And then go to Jesus. There's competition about a billion. By the time you go, billion other people are talking to him. How does he sort it out? Makes it a bit complicated. We don't pray through him. We pray in his name. When you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, it means, Father, at this point that I'm speaking, I'm not Mesa Otabel. I am Jesus. I am Jesus. Father, I come not in my own name, but in the name of Jesus. So you may not like Mesa Otabel. You may not like what I did yesterday, but this is Jesus talking to you. This is your son talking to you. And it is in his name that I speak. That is the basis of our prayer. If God was going to look at you to answer your prayer, your head is not nice enough. And sometimes even your prayer is not nice. Some of you use bad English to pray. And if God was judging, God was marking your prayer, he would say, look at the grammar. You are talking to your father in heaven. Look at the grammar you are using. Now. But God does not judge you based on grammar. He does not be, judge you based on your own merits. We are judged on the merits of him who died for us and rose again from us. His name is Jesus. And this is how we overcome. We say, Father, I come in the name of Jesus. The moment you say that, heaven opens for you. No angel can intercept your prayer.
because you go directly to the Father in the name of Jesus. That's our conviction. The word of our testimony. The word of our testimony is our claim. When, when we overcome by what we claim, taking pos full possession of what is ours. That phrase claiming, you know, if you're a believer, you, you've probably heard the phrase, claim your blessing, claim your promise in the name of Jesus. These phrases sometimes come from a historical background. When people settled in the United States of America, they settled first on the east coast of America, New York, uh, you know, Massachusetts, New England, east coast. Because most of them were coming from Europe. And they come to the first point, east coast, they settle. But the vast part of the U.S. was going to westward, getting to California from west, east coast to the west coast. People were not going there because everybody wanted the east coast. So they devised a way for people to own land. They used different methods for people to own land in the vast places. And one of the ways they devised for people to own land is uh, they would get people, mostly young men, very energetic, who wanted land to farm. And they would give you a, a peg in your hand, a peg in your hand. And uh, you start racing. The, you, you line up on your mask, get set, go. And you start running. And you run and run and run and run and run and run. And wherever you get to that you like, you put your pig peg there. Boom! You claim the land. And it's yours. The same thing happens to us as believers. When we become Christians, God says, Run all you want, but get to the point where you say, I claim this for myself. The word of our testimony is what we used to claim, what we want. So if you go through mushy land and you don't like it, you are just passing through. If you're going through thorny land and you don't like it, you are just passing through. But you get to a good and a healthy land, you say, I like this one. You take your peg and claim it. Now, I don't know where you are running in life now. Maybe you are running through thorny paths. Don't claim it. Don't say, as for me, my life. Life, suffer, suffer. I just came to suffer. You didn't come to suffer. You are going through it. it is, don't claim it for yourself. Don't say it is mine. Don't say it's my destiny. Go through it quietly. But one of these days, you will come to a land flowing with milk and honey. And when you come to that land, don't say that is for somebody else. That is your land. You have to take your peg and you have to claim it. I came here to announce to somebody, you're going through some tough land. You're going through some difficult land. But God is going to bring you to an open space. And you're going to take your peg and you're going to claim it. You're going to claim it. You're going to claim it. Most times when I go to many cities, most cities, I like to just look around and claim things. Somebody said, well, it's not for you. Oh, yeah. I am saying, as I see, so shall I possess. Not exactly what is there, but like what I see. I'm putting my peg down. Go put your peg somewhere. We overcome him by our confession. Saying the things that are in line with our faith. God said to Abraham, go and sacrifice your son Isaac. That is God speaking. God says, go sacrifice your son Isaac. Abraham has to determine how to deal with that word. How is he going to, what's he going to say around that word? God says, go, go and kill your son. But the same God says, in this son shall all your descendants be blessed. So God has said two things. This son is going to be the blessing. Go kill him. In between 
those two demands, Abraham has to structure his language. So he's going with Isaac to Mount Moriah. And Isaac looks around and says, Father, the wood, the fire, where is the lamb? Now at this point, you, 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 you can't fake it. You have to tell the truth. Now he could have said, listen boy, today is your last day on earth. I just want to tell you that Jehovah who has been speaking to me all this time, I don't know what went into his head, but he said I should kill you. So just let's go quietly. That was an option. He didn't exercise that option. He said, son, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. How did he know? God didn't tell him I would do that. But he claimed it with his mouth. He said there will be a replacement for you, son. There will be a replacement for you. He tells a young man. He's traveling with. He says, wait for us here. I and the boy will go and worship and come back so he says it's going to be a worship service up there God will provide himself a lamb and we will come back together that was not what God told him that is what he told God this is how we overcome the spirit of the Antichrist by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So you're trying to build that thing and all hell is coming against you and, and you can't see how this is going to be done. You don't say, I'm going through hell. You don't say, oh, I, I think this thing is going to fail. Oh, whew, I think I made a bad mistake. But you say, I'm going to worship and I will come back. The Lord will make a provision for me. There is somebody here, God is making provision for you. Tomorrow about this time, tomorrow about this time, God will reveal a provision. Thank you, Jesus. A provision that you never imagine will be revealed to you. So don't go kill yourself and kill your business with the word of your mouth. Don't go announcing your defeat when you are still in the battle. Don't go destroying yourself when God is building you up. God will provide himself In the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen. You will see it. For some of you, the vision on your heart is far bigger than your body. Your dream is bigger than your head. Your dream is bigger than your mouth. Sometimes you don't even want to talk about it because you, pe people will just crucify you for just saying it. Not doing it, saying it. And you look at that dream and you wonder, how is it going to be? This is how we overcome. The spirit of the Antichrist will get a thousand people to resist you. People who are already established in the industry. People who are powerful in the industry. People who have governmental power in the industry. They tell you, you will not do this. We will make sure you never do it. That is the spirit of the Antichrist coming against us. But we will overcome them. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. First, they can't harm you. Second, 
your mouth and your words will be the key to determine the outcome. If you, kill, if you tell Isaac, we're going to kill you, Isaac will die. If you tell Isaac, God will provide a lamb. God will provide a lamb. I don't know what Isaac you are carrying in your hand and how you feel about that Isaac. Maybe you have a dream. It seems like the dream is about to die in your hand. The vision is about to die in your hand. The purpose of God is about to die in your hand. You hold it in your hand and you just feel this is the end of this idea. I thought it was going to live. I thought something great was going to come out of it, but it didn't come out of it. The Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist has risen against it. People have rose, risen against it. People have struck it. And I think this has no future. Tonight, I came here just to announce to somebody much has come against you but you will go over it you've been in struggle you've been in struggle struggle you never thought you ever have but you are coming over it and I'm not the one making you overcome you will make yourself overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony There are businesses here to be manifested. There are people here with ideas that will shake the world. I have prayed and I believe God that in the next 12 years when Forbes magazine lists the richest people in the world number one will be a born again believer. Number two will be a born again believer. Number three will be a born again believer. We are displacing the unbelievers because the children of God are coming to their own. And we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Lift up your hands to God if you want to receive from God. And I want you to prophesy to your Isaac. Begin to speak to your Isaac. Begin to prophesy to your Isaac. Begin to make declarations to your Isaac. Baby, you are not dying. Idea, you are not dying. The Lord will provide himself. God will make a provision. We will go and worship. We are coming with a song of deliverance. We are coming up with a testimony. Of divine favor in the name of Jesus your past mistake will not sabotage your future promise your past will not stand in the way of your future you are called to overcome you are not called to bow no spirit of the Antichrist can stop you Mekatari irebo ziki andarabosha. Maro de sebriondo sakarende rebo shikiada. Munelelebo ziata raboko sheke riende reboza. Prophesy to your Isaac. Overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony prevails. The word of your testimony prevails. The word of your testimony to prevails.
no matter what is coming against you you are going over it you are going over it you are running over it you are jumping over it in the name of Jesus tonight is a point of demarcation you have jumped from struggle to victory you've caused the line of struggle it's not of your own will it's not of your own strength it's not of your own power 2,000 years ago a man hung on a tree called, on a place called Calvary he had done no sin and that man was God in the flesh he shed his blood, God's blood, poured on the earth to redeem the earth. It is that blood that gives you the victory. You may not see it, you may not feel it, but that blood is still at work. You don't need a talisman, you don't need a cross, you don't need to drink anything. That blood is efficacious. It's powerful. That blood saves every sinner. No matter what your sin is, he will wash you. No matter how far away you are from God, he'll bring you near. For everything I've said, this is the sum total of it. We overcome through Christ. If you're going to overcome, you need Christ. Not just courage, not bravery. It's Christ in you, manifested out of you. If you are here this evening and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not born again. Maybe you go to church, maybe you come to church here, you love the church, you love the pastor. Loving the pastor will not save you. Loving the music will not save you. Feeling good in the church is not salvation. If you are here this evening, please sit down everybody. And you say, I want to start a new journey with Christ. I want to start a new life with Christ. I want to begin life with him. I want to overcome through Christ. I want Jesus to come into my heart. And be my Lord and Savior. I want my sins to be forgiven. I want to be assured that when I depart this earth, I'm going to heaven. If that's your desire and you want to be born again and let Jesus come into your heart, just lift up your right hand wherever you are. Lift up your right hand. God bless you. Don't feel shy. Don't feel, lift up your hand. If you put up your hand, put up your hand. Let your hand go up. I see hands up. I see hands up. There's still some of you struggling. You say, well, should I? Is it necessary? Yes, this is necessary. Jesus says, if you honor me before men, I will honor you before my Father. Let your hand go up. Let your hand go up. Those of you with your right hand up, I want you to rise up wherever you are. Just rise up, let me see you. If you lifted up your hand, rise up, let me see you. You lifted up your hand, rise up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Those of you standing, there are people who have, are giving you some documents. And I want you to walk in the front, and I'm going to pray with you very shortly. Just walk in the front. If you lifted up your hand, walk in the front. Come to the front. Come to the front. You are taking the step of an overcomer. You're going to be strong. You're going to accelerate. Your life will never be the same. You are beginning a new life of victory in Christ. Victory over sin. Victory over Satan. Victory over your own limitations. I'm going to pray with you, those of you in front. For Jesus to come into your heart. 
just begin to talk to him and ask him to have mercy on you, forgive you of your sins, ask him to come into your life. Put your hand on your heart as we pray. Those of you in front, put your hand on your heart. Put your hand on your heart. And I'm going to lead you in prayer. And you say the same prayer with me. The whole church will join us as we say this prayer. Say with me, Heavenly Father. I've come to you today. Just as I am. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. Jesus died for me. To save me. Today. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, as my Lord. I receive him into my heart. Lord Jesus, I declare today, you are my Savior, you are my Lord. I surrender to you, I surrender to you, I surrender to you. I will live for you every day of my life. From this day onwards, in your name I have prayed. Amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer sincerely from your heart, I want to speak to you with every certainty and authority in my heart that every sin in your life has been washed away. The blood of Jesus has cleansed you and washed you. Everything you have done wrong in your life is gone out of your life. From today, you are starting a brand new life as a new creation in Christ. And let Christ lead you and walk with you and give you the victory that only he can give you. I, what, what would be the protocol? You'll follow these uh, people here and they will just talk to you for a moment and give you some material to help you to live the Christian life. Somebody say, I overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. No spirit of the Antichrist will stop me from manifesting Christ in the flesh. In Jesus' name, amen.